Welcome to Crazy Shit in Real Estate, a weekly podcast where I walk you through some of the wildest, most unbelievable stories you'll hear from the world of real estate. If you like real estate and you love crazy, this is the podcast for you. This is Crazy Shit in Real Estate, friends. I'm Lee Brown, your hostess with the mostest, and who's also a realtor and a speaker. And I like to bring you all the things that you're not going to get when you watch Million Dollar Listing, because while it's a fun, entertaining, mindless show, that ain't the real world. Real estate is so fascinating because as a profession, of course, it goes in a million different directions, often at a million miles an hour. And today, my guest is Trevor Mogg. Trevor, welcome to the show. Lee, I, I appreciate you bringing me on. And I absolutely love how candid you are on these episodes. I love it. So thank you for making me a part of the show. You know, life is easier that way. If you just kind of say what you think and, and think <laughs> what you say, then you don't have to go back and remember what you told anybody. 100%. I love it. I love it. So tell us a little bit about you. Where are you? What do you do in and around real estate? Give us a little bit of backdrop on Trevor. Yeah, Lee. So I, I'm uh, an entrepreneur. I've never had a job for any anyone else. Hasn't been easy. Hasn't been easy, but... Uh, I live in a small town in Oregon called Roseburg, a town of 25,000 people. And I didn't grow up here, but I kind of migrated here from another small town and then Portland for a few years. And uh, I started investing in real estate actually when I was in college. I was kind of literally Lee, the TV infomercial. I know, I know it's, it's cliche to say that, but the Carlton Sheets thing. Carlton Sheets, late it, night TV, it, holy it, smokes. It, it was. I was Did you in, buy was the, in, the cassette tapes or the DVDs? I didn't buy them, but uh, a friend's dad had them and he let me borrow them. And so basically I was able to go through and listen to them. I ended up picking up my first rental property there by the college I went to uh, when I was 21. Uh, from his methods, no money down of my own money. Owner carry, I still own that four unit apartment building today. Oh, wow. Ever since then, Lee, I, I, I really love the buy and hold side of real estate. So uh, I'm a buy and hold investor. I bought a commercial building next door down here that we're renovating. It's a historical building. Uh, the one that we're in now is an entrepreneur co workspace that I have. But on the day to day, on the day to day in real estate, we primarily help real estate agents and investors attract more leads online so you guys can have more consistency in your business, is what we do. So I got to ask, I mean, the world that we're in right now, Portland is the epicenter of a lot of drama. Do you, oh, man. do you envision keeping real estate going in that area or do your investments lie outside of metro areas at this time? Yeah, Portland's insane right now. Portland's crazy. I went up there a week or so ago and the news, of course, reports all the craziness. That's pretty much in like a two or three block area. The rest of Portland's great, uh, but I don't have any investments up there. So they're all in rural towns and smaller towns in Oregon. I wish I could say I was smart enough to be strategic there. I wasn't. It's just where I've lived. And I just had bought properties where I live. Uh, but they're all in more rural conservative areas next to colleges and things like that. So they're pretty darn stable. Look, you can't say conservative area next to colleges without realizing that's like a straight <laughs> amount of irony, but it's okay. So, but that's it is true, true though, because the beauty of real estate is that location, location, location. And we yep. find a lot of investors wind up buying things where they are because it's what you know. And because it's one of the only tangible investments out there besides gold, you can actually go drive by and look at it and see it and feel it and touch it. And that makes it just a, more of a more visible part of your portfolio. But that being said, so you said you bought your first property in college. And of course, you know, we all make fun of the Carlton Sheets method, but if it didn't work, it wouldn't be around all these years later. And it does. But what was the hardest thing for you to get past mentally or financially to make the first property happen? Because it's a, it's a big deal making any kind of a real estate purchase. Yeah, I think I think with that one particularly, you know, I was 21, so I had these limiting beliefs that I'm not old enough. Are they going to treat me seriously? Uh, at that time, I didn't have credit. Like, I, I didn't have bad credit. I just didn't have any credit at all. I didn't have any credit cards, nothing like that. So I couldn't get a loan from a bank. All of these limiting beliefs were stacking up and piling up in my mind. I'm not too, I'm not, I'm too young. They're not going to take me serious. I've never done a deal before. I've never owned a, any rental property, let, a four, let alone a four unit, and I can't get a loan. I think most people that would stop them, right? Most people that would say, well, um, it's just not right for me. I'll go the safe path. And uh, the thing that helped me, that helps me all the time, Lee, and I started to kind of develop this mindset in, uh, in those early years from a mentor of mine, basically I would then look at it and go, well, has anyone ever done this that's in my situation before? Has anyone ever bought a property that with no money uh, that doesn't have credit that is young? And the answer is categorically yes. I could find examples uh, on that online or other places. 
And then from there you go, well, cool. That's not a fact. Then it's, it's a limiting belief that you have. These things are not facts that you're feeding in your mind. And so then I just said, well, the only thing that's holding me back is me. I just need to go out and do it. And so that was the big thing for me. Had to, had to, had to acknowledge the limiting beliefs I had, recognize, are they fact or are they false internal beliefs based on something? And then I just plowed through and said, I'm just going to set a timeline and I'm going to, if I don't require a property within this next year, then I'll move on to something else. And uh, that for me has been a magical thing is giving real timelines and stuff, but giving enough time to say, I'm not going to quit uh, within this time frame. So as part of your goal to continue adding to that empire, do you have like buy one property a year, buy one every two years? What's the, what's the Trevor Mock plan? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't suggest anyone follows my, my investment plan <laughs> uh, per se. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty darn good at building businesses. Uh, I'm not great at building real estate portfolios yet. So I bought that property and it's usually probably every two to three years I've picked up another one. We own a couple of vacation homes that we Airbnb that have been, been working out great. Uh, when COVID hit, there was a period of time during, you know, probably about three to four weeks, maybe six weeks when we were getting cancellations left and right because oh, yeah. uh, Airbnb and VRBO, rightfully so, they opened it up so people could cancel without penalty because uh, they weren't traveling. But what happened, this is probably mid-April uh, or so, we started seeing everything else book up faster than it ever has the rest of the year. And so it's probably going to be the best year that we've ever had with our, our vacation rentals. And that'll be an interesting part of things too, because I think, especially in this environment that we're in, more and more people are going to seek out those types of properties rather than going to hotels with a lot more people in them, uh, since we are in this weird kind of shift, you know, societal so there's that. And then I have a couple of commercial buildings. So uh, the commercial one, same thing. I wouldn't suggest people uh, make investments in historical rural downtown uh, retail and office space right now. But for me, it's more of a purpose thing. Yeah, we, we, we work downtown. I love the town that we're in. Uh, we absolutely love it. We've been here since 08. And we want to be a part of changing downtown. And so we're trying to buy as many of the buildings as we can. There's another one across the street we're going to look at today that that is newly vacant. And uh, we're, our hope is that we can start to be a part of changing this area from the inside out. Well, so the building I'm in is a historic building in my downtown in Concord, North Carolina. And I did the same thing. I wanted to be a part of the revitalization and cool. be in the center of it because I love this town and I love this building. But Lord knows the historic building is a whole different <laughs> set of issues than you right. expect. And I just wish it were haunted because if it were haunted, it would make it all easier to deal with. It's not haunted. <laughs> But there you go. So I'd love to know in the space that you've been in, what's the craziest shit you've run into with real estate? As in the story you would tell over a, well, I can't say a cocktail because in Oregon, y'all are more like craft beer people. So over a good craft <laughs> beer, what story are you going to tell? Oh my gosh. There was one deal that my dad and I were involved in, in another small town, uh, the small town I grew up called Klamath Falls. And it was his deal, uh, but I was there alongside with him. And it's, it's, this, this is a lesson I carried forward from it. It was another historical building. It was uh, an old Ford auto uh, dealership from the 1930s. Oh, yay. And I'm a Ford girl. So that makes yeah. me happy. It, it was such a cool building. It, they, they had built in, it was this Egyptian theme, like inside and outside, these big columns. And, and it was this really, really cool building. And so he went into that building trying to turn it into an event center. And uh, we were working on that together. He took on a business partner. Uh, it was all a handshake deal. They didn't have a contract. And my dad's like, hey, you know, a handshake is a handshake and da-da-da-da. Long story short, he, in, he invested a few hundred thousand dollars into it. We put a ton of time into making this an event space, an event center. We're going to put um, retail shopping on the backside of it. Two things happened within six months. Uh, one of them was that business partner uh, decided to file for something with the, with the city saying that we didn't have any claim of ownership to the property. Uh, even though that we put all the money into the renovation of it. No. Um, it, yes. And then number two, a big snowstorm hit and it caved in the entire back two thirds of the property where all of the retail uh, was going to go into completely caved in everything. And so all that was left over was the front part, which was a half done event center and, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars put into that building up to that point. And at the end of the day, we lost the property. And so a good learning lesson this is about five years ago. My dad's a smart businessman. It's just kind of one of those things where no matter how smart we think that we are, we should still do things in a business-like way and get contracts. And um, we didn't have the right insurance on the property either. 
And uh, we ended up getting nothing from the deal and he ended up actually getting not just all of the equity we put into it, but he also got the insurance money that came from it because there was insurance, but he had it and we didn't, we didn't know that he had it on there. It was just this weird situation. So that's not one that I, I would love to admit to oftentimes, but we licked our wounds, walked away and said, uh, we'll, we'll be smarter next time. I mean, you learn from it, but it sounds like your dad's a little like mine. My dad's always a little heartbroken that the world isn't a handshake place anymore and that yep. people don't tend to have the honor to stick by the agreements that they make. And mm. it's unfortunately one of the things that real estate pros know. And it's, it's why that one of the first things we teach somebody when they get into the business is that it's, if it's not in writing, it's not enforceable. And so you yeah. have to chase down all the verbal agreements, but it sounds like the insurance piece is also an interesting lesson to have learned that I think many people when they're doing investing or they're doing commercial properties or renovations and flips or anything that's not, I'm going to buy a personal house and move in they forget you're going to have to insure it in the whole process, but you better make sure who's on that policy. That's some crazy stuff that yeah, Mr. The, Snakey Snake insured it and y'all didn't. <laughs> yeah, the policy was weird. We, we had, I can't remember the details on it specifically, but we had an insurance policy on it, but it wouldn't cover any of that stuff that happened. And so, uh, yeah, that, that was just same thing, unfortunate and no insult but ours. And so good, good learning lesson to, to be had there. And, and like I said, we'll, we'll uh, learn moving forward. That's craziness. So where did you buy your personal house? Is that somewhere in one of your little cool small towns too? Yeah. So Roseburg, we absolutely love this town. Uh, I grew up, like I said, in Klamath Falls, another town of about 25, 30,000 people in Southeast Oregon. And we live on, um, just, it's about three hours South of, of Portland on, on interstate five on I five. And this area here, it's kind of this cool little, this little, uh, you know, hidden gem back here. It's amazing for the outdoors as is, you know, where you live. There's two amazing rivers that run through town. I'm a big fly fisherman. So we actually bought a house, uh, three acres on the North Umpqua River, which uh, it's world-class steelhead fishing there for, um, you know, there's about 35 miles of fly only waters, which is so fun. Oh, wow. Um, great road cycling and mountain biking around here. And there's about 35 wineries out here and a bunch of orchards and things like that. And so, um, yeah, we've kind of fallen in love with the people here, fallen in love with the area. And we were just fortunate enough to, to, to be able to find a property that really fit. I, I know it's very cliche where people talk about vision boards. I've never been a vision board guy, but I've been a vision story guy, right? Where every year I write down and I readjust what I call my vision story. I've got a, a vision story that's, that's 25 years out, one that's 10 years out, one that's one year out. And then of course, from then on, it's our, it's our actual yearly plan. And so every year in January, I pull up this orange notebook that I've got in my bag and I write out the vision story. And literally from, I'm so detailed with it, Lee, where it's from the second that I wake up, like, what do I see? Where am I at? What's the room look like? What do I smell? What do I hear? Who's the first person I talk to? What are those words? Like when I get up and get out of bed, what do I do next? Um, you know, what is for breakfast? What conversations am I having? In 20 years, my kids aren't going to be at the house. Hopefully they're, they're 10, eight and six. So hopefully they're not at the house still then. But when I go out there, you know, who's going to be in there? Same thing. What's the house look like? When do I go to work? What do I do at work? Uh, you, can, you can get the picture right from start to finish. And, and it ends up being a couple pages. But for me, I get so excited about my own story. You know, pe people are, uh, I think we all get wrapped up in reading stories. And I love reading books too. But, but, you know, very seldom do we actually write a story about ourselves that we're crazy excited about that we want to read. And we're like, man, I would love to live that life. Like I would love for me to be there. And the reason I brought this up was I wrote my first vision story probably about 10 years ago. And a part of that vision story was I wake up in a house on a body of water, big, huge window in our bedroom, watching the sunrise come up. And it didn't hit me until probably about a year after living in this house, after we'd started to do some renovation, because uh, we'd busted out this really small window in our master bedroom, put in a big, huge sliding glass door. And I woke up one morning because we didn't have blinds or any window coverings on that door yet. And I woke up sunrise right there, the big river right there in the view. Cause I couldn't see the river view when I was laying in bed before, cause there was a window instead of a big flying glass door. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is so crazy. Like what I had written in my vision story is like, this is it. And even though I can't say that I bought the house with that in my mind, it's just crazy what happens when you write down your intention, you review it often, you get excited about it. 
So how hard was it to build the discipline to get that done? Because I think a lot of people have the grandiose ideas of journaling and diary writing, and they do it for about mm, a day, and then suddenly it becomes no priority. How hard was it? Oh, my gosh. So I've tried every different type of journal you can imagine. I've got four different types of journals down here, and I've just relegated to giving them to employees of mine. Uh, We have 37 people here at Carrot now, and some of them like journaling, and, and I don't. So that kind of stuff for me too, Lee, like if you're in that spot or for other people listening to you in that spot where you don't feel like you're the consistent disciplined person to, to, to journal and write, I am the same way. What I get excited about though, is I will create the discipline to on a quarterly basis, read that, that vision story, because I know that unless I'm intentional about where I want to go and unless I'm crafting my story, then someone else is crafting my story for me. And so um, I think I just had to really get over that mindset of, you know what, I'm not a guy who's normally disciplined and regimented with, with habit, but I have to be that person if I want to get where I want to go with certain things. So that's one of those things. I've got a couple other processes too over the years that have really helped me get closer to where I want to go in business and life. Uh, one of them, this would have been shoot, 2011, 2012, I was going through a big transition just career-wise, happiness and fulfillment-wise. Like I mentioned before, I've never worked for anyone else. So I left college, gave myself a year to say, hey, I don't know how I'm going to make this entrepreneur thing work, but I'm going to give myself a year and I'm not going to quit within that year. If I get to month 13 and I discover that I just didn't nail what I wanted to nail, then I'll go look for a job. But during this year, I'm not going to stop. And so it took me about eight or nine months to, to finally have a mindset shift where things are starting to kind of click, you know, eight or nine months of grinding of of putting out marketing proposals and getting them all turned down because I didn't know how to market. That led into my next couple companies, which did pretty well. But I remember waking up, Lee, in 2011, 2012. We had our first daughter in 2010. And during that two years or so, I woke up probably more often than not, not wanting to do the work that I had created for myself. I had my own company. I was making you know low six figures as a mid 20 something year old guy, beautiful wife, amazing daughter. And uh, a house that, that, that we loved. And I realized I just wasn't grateful for what I had. Like that was, that was the big thing. I wasn't grateful. I wasn't in gratitude, but number two, I wasn't pumped about the work I was doing. You know, the, the products we had were good. The customers we had, I, would, I, I, I liked and loved our, our small team was great. But for me, I'm like, man, the mo- at the end of each week, I feel like I'm getting a lot of work done, but my energy is just drained out of me. You know, I get home and there's no energy left for my daughter, for my wife. And so I created this process called the energy audit. At the start, it was really simple. It was like literally, you know, lying down the middle of the paper. I actually drew this out the other day for a team member. I was walking a team member through it, but lying down the middle of the paper. And so you can do this anywhere. And on one side, you write, you know, energy giving. And on the other side, you write energy draining. Mm -hmm. And so I started to do that. And I'm like, okay, what are all the things in my life right now that are draining my energy? Work, anything else? And then on the other side, what are all the things in life that give me energy, especially the things I'm not putting time into? Like I wasn't working out, but it gives me energy when I do it. I'm going to put it on the list. And so it was cool because it at least helped me acknowledge what gives me energy and, and, and not. I did that for a couple quarters and acknowledging it and noticing it is important, but it still wasn't moving things. So the next I'm like, well, you can't really move what's not measured, right? You've ever, everyone's heard that quote. So at the bottom, I started to write, well, what percentage of an average week uh, am I doing energy draining things versus energy giving things? Okay. So now I've got a, a barometer. I've got something that I can grade it on. And at that time, it was about 80% energy draining, 20% energy giving. And I found for me, I need to be over 50% energy giving to feel like I'm getting in momentum in life and business. And so here's where the magic was leading. I'll toss it back over to you. Is Then I went, okay. So if I know what is draining my energy and what gives me energy in life and business and work, and I, can, and I can tell right now kind of what my ratios are. And if I'm below 50% energy giving, that's why I'm not loving what I'm doing. So now how do I trade off more, get rid of more of these and add more of those, right? So you circle one or two of the top things that are draining your energy. I'd write down how many hours per week each of those are taking me. So let's say this one's you know, seven hours a week of that activity and seven hours a week of that activity. I mean, that's 14 hours a week of stuff that is just draining my energy. But maybe it's what makes me money. Like maybe we have to actually do that because... That's the activity that brings in money, but I don't want to be doing that anymore, right? If, if, even if those things are the activity that makes me money, I don't want to do those anymore. So the very first thing I would do each quarterly 
is I would take those things and I'll put them down at the bottom and say, these are the very first things I'm planning for the quarter to get off my lap. I'm going to create a process where I'm going to delegate. Then I'm going to take those 14 hours and add in one of these energy giving activities or two of them to fill up that 14 hours. And over the course of about 18 months, I kept on doing that every quarter along with reviewing that vision story and things changed completely. It went from me you're not wanting to do the work to actually mean getting rid of those two companies, uh, completely transitioning over, shifting my mindset, starting what became Carrot. And uh, now I love my work way more often than not. I'm about 80% energy giving, 20% energy draining right now. Everything's not perfect, but I can tell you that uh, things are insanely good compared to where they were before. And this can work for anyone, no matter if you're an entrepreneur or not. Well, it definitely falls in with what Dan Sullivan teaches in the strategic coach program. Yep. I don't know if you know Dan, but he talks I went through about, that program for a year. You, yep. You're, you're, you're speaking Dan's language over there with those tools. I've done that program a few times and he's a, he's definitely a game changer. So if somebody's interested, if they're a realtor or a realtor affiliate, they're interested in learning more about Carrot, how do they get a hold of you and check out the company? Yep. Best place is go to carrot.com uh, or we have a podcast where we dive into a lot of you know, life success stuff and a lot of stuff for real estate agents and investors. It's carrotcast.com or find it on Apple iTunes or Spotify. Sounds good. All right, guys. So go to the show notes at any time, check it out, reach out to Trevor and find out more about what he's doing to maybe reduce some of the things you don't want to have in your life. Cause there's a lot of energy drainers that you can outsource. If you find people who found solutions to that, Trevor, thank you for coming on the show and sharing some of your inputs and some of your thoughts. Really appreciate the concepts you're sharing. Lee, I, I appreciate it big time too. If there's any way that we can help you guys out, let us know. And everyone listening to this, like keep, keep following Lee. I mean, she's uh, an amazing leader. Uh, her, her stuff is entertaining. There's a lot of really boring real estate stuff out there. And so keep, keep doing what you're doing, Lee. I appreciate being a part of it. Absolutely. Goal, definitely not to be boring. That's why I want the big explicit E on my podcast. I love it. All right, guys. So if you have something to share related to real estate or around real estate, or you just got some story you need to be on crazy shit in real estate and tell, hit me up on any of the social networks to be featured. Give me five stars and subscribe so we can get to the top of Apple and really blow out those boring podcasts. They're just too boring. It. Otherwise, I'll see you next time. If you are listening to this episode and you need to tell us something about your crazy life in or around real estate, then tweet me at Lee Brown or reach me on any of the social networks. That's if you're a broker, realtor, investor, inspector, lender, or just a regular normal human being who happens to have dealt in real estate. Subscribe for more episodes. And as always, we are thrilled that you joined us for some crazy shit in real estate. See you next time. <laughs>